saying I'm sort of doubly thrilled to be here. First, uh, kindness to invite me to to talk in this seminar on what's such an interesting topic, but also to Jay for organizing this series, which is um, there are you know, numerous really, really interesting talks in this series, and I'm certainly looking forward to attending as many of those as I can. Um, and I think one thing that's um, one thing that I think is really significant about this is the recognition of the cultural significance of football um, in the in the MENA world, but but more generally, I think in the, in the academy, people are coming to recognise more and more that this is a really significant cultural practice. And um, I should confess right from the beginning, of course, I'm I'm an economist, so by background, so not used to thinking about culture and history used to being somewhat reductionist about the world. And yet one thing that I learned through studying sports is because the rules are essentially arbitrary, then you, if you want to understand why sport is played in a particular way and why it involves particular economic relations, you have to really study the culture and history that behind it in order to understand why they chose to do it this way rather than that way. It's not like manufacturing semiconductors where technology dictates that things must be done in particular ways. Actually, with sports, we have a lot of freedom to choose how it should be played and thinking about the interactions of those decisions with economics, which does play a role, has been, um, you know, a, a focus of, of my research. So I'm going to I'm here. So in some ways, I'm here as an economist, but I'm here to put try to put that in the context of the culture and history um, of sport in the Middle East. And, and one of the things that with this sort of opening slide, I've pointed out some of the some of some uh, uh, points about um examples of uh, the way in which um, football has played into the culture of um, uh, the MENA nations. Um, the uh, uh, So if I just go around and point out these pictures, here you have um, Paul Pogba and Ahmad Diallo, two Manchester United players carrying a Palestinian flag in 2020 on the, on the field at Old Trafford in Manchester, England, in solidarity with uh, Palestine. Here you have Saudi women celebrating the start of being able to play um, football in Saudi Arabia. Um, here on the right-hand side at the top, you have Cristiano Ronaldo, a very young Cristiano Ronaldo, at age, I think it was 19 at the time, playing for Portugal in the 2004 Olympics and looking rather sad because his team is being beaten 3-2 by Iraq. And in fact, Iraq went on to win that game 4-2, uh, one of the sort of glorious victories of the Iraqi team. Here you have an, an image of the, uh, of the uh, Al Ali Ultras. And um, so again, one thing, a confession, not being a MENA specialist, I am in danger of butchering lots of names as we go through, I'm happy to be if you want to stop and correct me, as it's important to try to get these things right. But I will I will do my best. But um, this is particularly famous. You can see just about see that the, the banner here says never forget. Never forget the 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 murder of 72 Al Ali fans, the uh, uh, one of the biggest team in Cairo, in Egypt, um, after they were attacked by rival fans at a game. Um, widely believed to be with the connivance of the of the government and the police. Um, here, more happily, you have Lionel Messi being robed by the Emir of Qatar with the president of FIFA uh, at the final of the World Cup in 2022 after they after Argentina's victory. Here, down here, you have the 1934 Egyptian team national team which competed in the World Cup. In fact, not by no means the first time the Egyptian national team have played. They played, they also participated in the 1920 Olympic Games and uh, actually won a game against uh, the Yugoslavia at the time. Here, uh, more recently, it's 
might be familiar. This is the Moroccan team celebrating after defeating Spain uh, in the World Cup in 2022 on penalties. Um, a great moment in Moroccan football history. And here, again, somewhat um, more controversially, you have, and again, I'm going to probably going to butcher names, but here you have uh, players from two teams in Israel, B'nai Saknin, the, um, an Arab team that plays in the Israeli league, and Beta Jerusalem, um, a Jewish team in the same league with uh, a, um, uh, a rivalry that has been, that has often erupted into violence. So in many ways, this, I use these to kind of, sort of illustrate how the cultural centrality of sport in the Middle East, North Africa region. And with, of course, many people around the world now are familiar with the MENA and football through the World Cup in Qatar in 2022 and with the recent spending spree of the Saudi Professional League going out and buying players like Ronaldo to go and play in Saudi Arabia and spending large sums of money. And when I get called by journalists about this, often the tone is one of surprise if they're not familiar with Mina, because they say, well, well you know, what's, what, why, is this, why is this suddenly happening? And they don't seem to be aware of this huge long history of football in the region. And that's one of the things I'm going to spend a lot of time um, talking about. Um, if I could move my slides. No, what's, why am I not? Oh, is that? Oh, just, just, okay. So, um, just to illustrate this point, I wanted to use a, a kind of a classic example. So, um, Probably one of the, the greatest writers about Middle Eastern culture, Edward Said. And I was uh, spending time reading his autobiography that, uh, called Out of Place, in which he writes about what it was like growing up in the Arab world between 1935 and 1962, a world which he says in the book is to, to a large extent disappeared. And it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, it's a very moving and and, and very wistful uh, book of, and tells his story. And he tells his story of growing up in, in Jerusalem and Cairo. Um, and there's a picture of him in the, in the middle with his little sister, um, which is rather cute. Um, and Edward Said is not a person you associate with sport for good reason. He never really expressed any great interest in sport himself in his later life and his work. So it might be surprising to know that actually football crops up quite a bit in his book. So I did a keyword search and you can see here the word football actually appears 19 times in the text. So he clearly had something to say about it and it clearly affected him. And I think this illustrates again how far back it goes. Now, it's not a happy story. It's not that he liked football. He didn't. In fact, one of the reasons he didn't like football was that he was terrible at playing it. And he tells this terrible story about how he was made to play in a game about the age of 10 and his dad came to watch him and he just didn't know what to do. He didn't know how to kick the ball. He didn't want to chase after it. And he was just, it was just frozen in the headlights. And so it's quite a sad story and it clearly marked him for life. And he talked about this and the reason, but the reason this had such an impact is because his dad was a good football player and had played for his school, St. George's School in Jerusalem. And that's a picture of the team from 1923. His dad was actually at St. George's School before the First World War. He moved to, he, he actually emigrated to America in two, 1911, I think, and only came back 20 years later. So, um, so really at the turn of the 20th century, um, Edward Said's dad is well known as a, uh, a a football player and is very proud of his ability to play this game. And of course, part of this, part of the, the issue for Edward Said is, and he talks about this, his name. Edward is the ultimate quintessentially English name. 
and he's given this name and he doesn't know well what's he meant to be is he arab is he english which which part of the world is he is he actually um really connected to and the same goes for football the football comes through the english and the question is then how is it mediated how how do you adopt it into your world no no um, okay, so I have essentially two theses I want to explore in this talk. Um, uh, um, one is that the culture of football is essentially a local culture, and I'm going to explain in some detail as to why that is, whereas the economics of football is essentially global. So for the moment, I just want to point out that this, this juxtaposition this, this nature of the game as being essentially something you understand intensely through local rivalry. Whereas the, the actual players who play it, at least at the professional level, are you know, globally mobile. Players go to wherever they're most valued and they travel the world. And so you have this contrast between what matters to most fans, which is the local game, and the nature of the players of the game who are moving globally. And these two things, these two um, factors sort of contrast with each other and inter interact in ways that are interesting. So let me start off by talking about how, um, well, let me first talk, talk about how we should think about sports in general. So we need some framing to even think about to address these questions. And the classic distinction, which goes back to um, a sociologist called Alan Gutman, is this distinction between what he calls folk sport and modern sport. And basically, folk sport is pretty much anything before, almost anything before 1850. And actually, quite a lot of, of, of sports which are still currently played today. Modern sport, he said, which is something which emerges largely in the 19th century, not entirely, but largely in the 19th century, has these characteristics, he suggests. And the whole framing of this is structure and organization, such that you have fixed known rules which people follow, and you have, um, you have a bureaucracy which administers the sport, and you are able to then maintain a constant set of records through time. So for example, we can have a record of every single international football game ever played going back to 1872, which represents a database of around 40,000 games now, and which, or which, they're like, if you like, they're like statistics produced by the United Nations. They are standardized. Actually, there's actually less dispute about the nature of these statistics than there is about most um, economic statistics that you can think of. Who won the game, when it was played, these are facts which are known and recorded. And when you go to the early days, there's, there's a little bit of doubt, but you know, in the last 30 years, there's really no question at all. There's a there's a film you can go and watch if you don't if you doubt it, and there's no question if you lost the game. You can say you didn't, you shouldn't have lost the game. Your team shouldn't have lost the game, but if you lost, you lost. That's it. Too bad. Um, so, so that's what distinguishes modern sport from folk sport. So sport is something of game playing is something that has gone on everywhere throughout the world throughout history. People have kicked balls, hit balls with sticks, done every kind of athletic activity that you can imagine. There's nothing new about sport in general. But modern sport is distinct. And even things like people talk often talk about the ancient Olympics as if we know anything about the ancient Olympics. Actually, we really don't. People say with great confidence that the first Olympic games were in 796 BCE. Actually, we don't know that for sure. It might have been. We don't. We know barely any rules. We have. We have the names of people who won titles, but really, we don't know very much. We don't know. Obviously, we don't have times or distances or anything like that. So, in that sense, almost everything that you think of before anything you can think of before the 18th century, before the 19th century, is really 
constitutes folk sport because we don't know. And it may have been that at the time they kept rock girls. Who knows? Maybe we'll one day discover there's these amazing Sumerian records of uh, a sport being played with rules and names and everything. But as, as of now, we have nothing of that nature. So um, that's the distinction between folk sport and modern sport. And that's important for thinking about football because football is a game that's been around for centuries at least. And it's certainly around in England, we know for sure, back six, seven, eight hundred years ago. Um, and the main reason we know about that is because of laws prohibiting it, which tells you something about what football was in that, what folk football was. It was an informal activity played with rules that were could vary significantly from one place to the next, from one year to the next. And we knew that it was in many ways seen as antisocial, was not, was not particularly prized. And certainly the kings of England were quite adamant that this is not something that should be going on. And we should distinguish that from modern football, which really goes uh, is originates with uh, the, the foundation of the Football Association in 1863, which establishes a uniform set of rules, a uniform set of rules about how the game will be played, what kind of field it will be played on, how many players there are on each team, all these kind of details that actually enable you to ensure that when at the start of a game, every game looks the same. Even if the outcome will be different, every game starts with the same framing. Um, and that starts with, and that that simple um, organizational structure enables certain things to follow. So you can create a recognized competition which you can follow from year to year. So in England, the FA Cup's created in 1871. You can start to play games against other countries. So the first international game is actually Scotland versus England um, in 1872. Then you start to be able to have recognized professionals making a living out of it. Again, professionals recognized in England in 1885. And you can found a league, the Football League, the English Football League founded in 1888. So all of these things bring bureaucracy, they bring rules, they bring records. And of course, the other thing is they do is bring money. And so this now becomes an economic proposition because it is a larger structure than simply people uh, meeting on an ad hoc basis to play to arbitrary rules on a particular date, a particular time. So I, I've added this quote because um, uh, in when obviously here we're talking about football in the Middle East and I'm already talking about England. So why why is that? And so A. J. B. Taylor was a was 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 a great English historian. And if you read this quote, you might it well if you're a mean specialist, you're probably going to splutter at this somewhat. Um, so the most democratic game and also the most international. By it, the mark of England well, may well remain in the world when the rest of her influence has vanished. To which I think Amina especially says, you've got to be kidding. Isn't the mark of England in the world, all the arbitrary borders and the chaos it created in regions like the Middle East? And I want you to be, but I want you to think about this. He said this in 1965, and he was writing a book on English history for English people. And actually, if you understand it properly, he's actually teasing the English. He's at, what he's actually saying is, you know, because in 1965, the British still think they're a global power. Well, many of them still do to this day. And of course, but now we know that's laughable. They still had a credible argument, perhaps, in 1965. And what A.G.P. Taylor is pointing out is that actually um, the culture, the cultural influence is significant. So although it sounds like an inaccurate, it sounds like a terrible thing to say, it's not actually quite as bad when you put it in context. And there's no doubt that the English, the imitation of English football played a significant role in uh, MENA nations from the get go. So I'm going to use Egypt and Algeria as my two examples. Actually, we could use pretty much any any countries uh, in, in, in the region to look at this. But 
Um, let's start with Egypt. So the British military occupation of um, Egypt takes occurs in 1882 after the Anglo-Egyptian War. And just right off the bat, at least eight of the officers lo uh, stationed in Egypt after 1882 had already played in an FA Cup final in England in the 1870s. So football is around and is they're bringing this as their baggage with them. It's part of the baggage that the British military bring with them. And they found clubs, sporting clubs in which to play, which initially are just for the British. So uh, interestingly, this, uh, so here's a couple of examples, the Gezira Sporting Club in 1882, the Heliopolis Club in 1905, two, two of these clubs. These clubs changed their identities over time. And interestingly, um, you read some historians and they'll write about how the Gezira Club was exclusively for the British. Well, actually, go back to Edward Said, there's a story in Out of Place about how his family belonged to the Gezira Club. However, a British member of the club at one point tells young Edward to get off the grounds because it's only for the British. Again, there's this sort of ambiguity. He goes to his dad and says, we're members, aren't we? And his dad says, leave it to me, I'll, I'll sort it out. And he never does. And, that's, and actually, Said writes interestingly about what that really tells you about colonial relationships. But the two great football clubs of Egypt in Cairo, Al-Ali and Zamalek are founded um, in the first decade of the 20th century and are primarily founded as vehicles for Egyptians. So the Egyptians start to say, we want our own clubs. If you colonial British are not going to let us play, we will establish our own. And you see the emergence of these clubs really right back at the beginning of the 20th century. Algeria is a little bit different because the French are a little bit different. Um, of course, the conquest of Algeria is sort of complete by 1848, and the French were, were, were kind of slow to arrive in the sporting landscape. Um, actually, their first real interest in sport comes in the 1880s, where they see it as a form of military exercise. So the early clubs in Algeria are entirely for Europeans because they are afraid that Algerian nationalists might start training and getting ready for combat themselves. Um, and so you have a different world. Um, but after the First World War, you see a sudden explosion of football clubs in Algeria. Just dozens of clubs are created, including clubs that are specifically for Muslims. So you see this new development emerging. Um, and the French get, but still the French colonialists get very nervous about this. They institute its rule. Every Muslim club must have at least three non-Muslims on the club. That is specifically a surveillance device. Apparently, it wasn't terribly well enforced, but nonetheless, it just tells you something about the nature of colonial of, of French colonialism. Um, uh, so you've got this this uh, the the colonial import of football and the way that that is absorbed into the colonial um, world. But football also then becomes an instrument of anti-colonialism. So um, the Egyptianizing of, of, uh, of football in Egypt takes place largely after 1919, when there's a, uh, a, a rebellion against the, the British, a revolutionary war, which leads the British to cede uh, not complete independence, but a, a greater degree of independence. Um, and so you then see the Egyptians start to introduce rules which specifically exclude non-Egyptians from participating in their clubs. And you see the English who had tried to impose their administrative systems, the English Egyptian Football Association, and the Egyptians saying, get away. We're going to have the Egyptian Football Association, and you English can get lost. And that leads then to seeing this rise, the, 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 the Egyptian national team become this symbol of Egyptian identity, participation in the 1920 Olympics. Um, they participate in Olympic competition. They actually were going to the first World Cup in which took place in Uruguay in 1930, but they missed the boat, which that was again travel in those days was was much more contingent than it is today. Um, perhaps even more famously, um, football in Algeria was closely connected to the Algerian Revolution. 
Um, so um, in October, um, uh, uh, sorry, in February 1957, um, the, the Algerian FLN uh, 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 nationalists um, set off multiple bombs inside football stadiums in Algiers as a protest against colonial rule. Um, they actually managed to assassinate uh, one of the uh, famous Algerian, um, what they call collaborators, um, at a football match in Paris. Um, uh, and then um, the FLN football team between 1958 and 1962 played a significant role in establishing international sport for Algeria. Um, so they set up their own separate team. Now, the French had tended to co-opt Algerians into um, their national teams, unlike the British, who were kind of standoffish and didn't necessarily want foreigners to come and play in England. The French decided that they would improve their teams by bringing the best of their colonial subjects to play in France. And so in the, between the two wars, you get uh, a lot of... Um, uh, Algerian players playing for French teams. Uh, in fact, um, Ben Bella, the, 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 the first president of Algeria, was actually played a game for Marseille in 1940, I believe it was. So he was, a, he was also a very good footballer. Um, but this FLN, they, the, Alger the FLN created their own football team to, and the French government ensured that FIFA would not recognize them but they actually got to play a lot of games. They played a lot of games against teams in the MENA region. And they also got to play uh, quite a lot of games against communist countries who were supportive of their independence movement. Um, and those games actually, there's the symbolism of playing these games um, was, was, was very powerful. And of course, immediately they gain independence. The FLN team then becomes the Algerian national team. So this is a, a point which I think is, is by no means true of the MENA region alone. Um, football has been part of nation building in the post-colonial era. And if you look at that, so what I've recorded here is the dates of the first international game, the dates that they joined FIFA and the dates that they joined the United Nations. And, and of course, before the Second World War, it's the League of Nations and you have several of uh, the teams joining before the, the League of Nations. Um, and what you, what you can see here is that it's as likely that you join FIFA before you join the United Nations as after. In other words, one of the first things of the, on the agenda of any independence movement historically was to play international football. Because inter playing international football was a recognition that you had arrived as a nation, as a separate nation. You had gained your sovereignty. Um, and so uh, for the most part, you see these countries joining FIFA either before or immediately after joining the United Nations. There are very few cases where that's not the case. Um, uh, of course, interesting one, Saudi Arabia doesn't join FIFA until 1959, although uh, joining the United Nations in 1945. That's because football was illegal in Saudi Arabia until 1958. This was completely banned because it was seen as being on Islam. Uh, but mostly you see their um, countries joining. Again, Palestine, obviously, because of the political issues, you see um, playing football from 1966, but actually gets into FIFA um, in 1998. Um, uh, it's still not recognized as a, as a separate nation by uh, the United Nations, but does have observer status, so it has some recognition. And you see at the bottom there, Iraqi Kurdistan. That's an interesting case as whether Kurdistan will ever achieve nationhood. Um, uh, but again, more likely that they'll get into FIFA before they get into the United Nations. So clearly, historically, Football has been at the center of nation building in these states. But the other point to bear in mind is that club typically comes long before the nation. Right? So the, the clubs that we talked about, we, so what I've done here is 
These are not the old necessarily the oldest clubs in these countries, but these are one. I have identified the the big three clubs in each country, the big three, the ones that have won the most league titles historically, and of those big three, I have identified the the date, the foundation date of the oldest, and compare that with the date of joining FIFA, and typically. The, it's about 10 to 20 years before you join FIFA that you found your biggest, or one of your big three clubs. So these clubs go back a long way. And again, we've, uh, we, you think about, uh, again, apologies, I was sure whether we were to include Turkey in MENA or not. I know it's a, it's a, you know, depends on the, on the, on the framing. But again, you see Turkey with his first club back in 1903, even though it's one of the earliest to join FIFA. And you can see, again, most of these clubs are, are created well before um, joining FIFA, which tells you there's a thriving football culture even before you have the formal administrative structure. And I think that's an important point. To bear so, um, Wikipedia tells me that that is Arabic for football derby. Um, even again, the phrase is an interesting one. Uh, the word, again, according to Google Translate, that is pronounced derby in Arabic. Again, I'm open to being corrected. If that's not. Again, in British English, we say derby. American English, it's derby. British English, it's derby. And the very origin of that word tells you something. So what is it? What is a derby? Well, so derby is uh, basically it's a town in England. Um, and it's also the name of a very of the most one of the most famous horse races in England. This horse race goes back 250 odd years. And derby, the town of derby is famous for a football game which goes back to the mists of time. Uh, it, it's historically that and it could be. The origin could be to do with that football game. It could be to do with the horse race. But it's clearly a word which has passed into Arabic as representing the rivalry of clubs within a region. And so what I hear, I've got the, the I picked out, again, the three most successful clubs in league history. So the three, the clubs that have won the most championships. Um, and I've got there the, the list of how many championships. So most of these Countries have had national championships that have been playing for 50 years or so, some a bit longer, a few slightly fewer. Um, and one, one thing to notice, these three clubs, if you look at the percentage of championships won, I've ranked them from highest to lowest. So in Egypt, they've won 94% of the championships. So in Egypt, if you're not in one of these three clubs, you might as well not turn up. And actually, to be honest, Ismaili... It, they might, they might as not well turn up either, because I think they won two. It's actually almost all of those championships are won by Al-Ali and Zamalek. Again, the three uh, clubs in, in Istanbul, Galatasaray, Fenerbahce and Besiktas, they have won pretty much all of the titles in Turkey. Uh, in Jordan, uh, Al-Faisali, Al-Waydat and Al-Ali have won 86 percent. So you can see that a small number of teams are winning all of these. And where are they located? Well, in all, in, they're either all in the same city or they're divided between two cities. There's one case there with Syria where you've got three cities. But otherwise, there's almost always a concentration. And a significant fraction like Turkey, like Jordan, like Iran, like Iraq, like Qatar, well, Qatar small, so maybe not so striking, but like Lebanon, these are countries of some size where you could have had multiple cities, but actually they're dominated by rivalries within a city. And that's what I mean by football is local. Football is about these local rivalries. This is what drives interest in. These are the teams with the biggest supporter bases. They are the most successful teams and they are based around either, either the same city or two within the same city and one that's reasonably close. Um, so that that's um, that's key. And this is what this is 
the manifestation of football, the 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 way in which football in, impinges on people's lives. This is what people go to watch week in, week out. You go to watch your local game. The World Cup comes along once every four years. If you're waiting for the next one, then you really need to find something else to occupy. You really need to get out more if that's what you're waiting for. Whereas, you know, if you if you follow these teams, you've got a weekly rivalry, which you're either you're playing your rivals or you're trying to get a better result than your rivals in the league so that you can move on to success. And that brings me to my my next point, really, which is about associativity. So if you think about what the if football is about clubs, what is a club? Club is an expression of associative life, right? And within that, you need some kind of permission, some kind of, uh, uh, you need to be allowed to organize a club because you need to be allowed to associate with other people in order to do that. You can't force a club on your own. And freedom of association is not something historically that has been the norm in the world in general. In general, the powerful have wanted to retain control of their power by limiting the rights and abilities of people to get together. The fear is if people get together, it becomes a conspiracy against the government. That's the fear. And therefore, historically, freedom of association has been a highly, it's been highly restricted. Um, and the colonial, the colonialists were quite big on this kind of restriction of freedom of association. I mentioned earlier the rule for the Muslim teams in Algeria. They had to have three non-Muslims on the team just in order to keep an eye on them. So there was these kind, and there were, the French had detailed laws on freedom of association. Again, the French and the British adopted different strategies in colonialism. The French wrote it down and made explicit rules about what kinds of associations were permitted, and they were highly restrictive. The British tended to do it more with a nod and a wink. It was more about can you can you um, can you persuade people in power, and the people in power kept a very close eye on what you were doing and made sure that it was not contrary to British interests. Um, and these restraints have left their mark on the MENA states. And many of these restraints were translated over into the post-colonial rule. And indeed, in many cases, they have been extended. So if anything, um, arguably, um, freedom of association is, 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 in many cases, more restricted even than it was in colonial. And as a result, those associations which are permitted have often become the location of political contestation, if you like. Um, so just to give you an idea of freedom of association, here there's a there's a there's a project called Varieties of Democracy, uh, which produces indices uh, of, of political freedoms uh, across the world, um, and one of them uh, is freedom of association. Their 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 main interest is in the notion of democracy, um, and so the freedom of association indices that they produce are um, are just one small part of their entire project. But what they uh, what they do is they give a they give a score to each country and each region um, based on these indices, and that means you. So what I've done here is rank them out of the countries that are available. Now, of course, uh, and they do this going back, and they've used documentary sources. If you're interested, you can read up on on the methodology that they did. And of course. In any such system, there's going to be a disagreement about methodologies. We can argue about what's whether this is the best methodology, whether it could be better, whether it's um, there could be biases in their methodological approach. 
Um, so, you know, I, one shouldn't necessarily take this as gospel, but it is striking, I think, that again, what, what you see here is, is in, in 1900, and notice the number of entities are, is increasing over time. In 1900, most of the MENA region, and they're not independent states by that time, of course, but most of them rank pretty low on the in terms of um, freedom of association. But then in the period between the period of, of, of gaining independence, um, between 1950 and 1965, actually in many cases, there's sort of a, a blip, there's kind of an improvement. Um, uh, not in all cases, but, you know, if you look at, so for example, um, Israel, right at the top, ranks 138, so right at the bottom in 1900, then goes up and is really quite high on the list, 2731. And then look, by 2022, it's really it's really fallen back. And um, Lebanon, you don't have a figure for 1900, but you do see, again, Lebanon's got substantially worse comparing 1950 and 1965. Um, and pretty much uh, every country has got substantially worse um, in the in the most recent period. Um, and um, you can, and this is a this is a good area to research, obviously. I mean, but there's there's quite a lot of documentation about laws relating to um, what are called civil society organizations. So basically private associations that people can form. And um, if you're interested in a country by country analysis, this reference here um, talks through country by country, some of the regulations, laws and regulations applying in these cases. And you can, but essentially um, the, if you read, read that it, it really supports this view. And of course, some countries like Saudi Arabia have always been at the bottom, right? So it's been at the bottom there, it's, it's always been right at the bottom, but you see um, quite a lot of variation. And again, what this implies is, is that those associations which are permitted are going to be the locus of political protest. If you can't protest by forming associations, you're gonna protest the football matches. And there is a long history of that. And we see football as uh, political actions. I've already um, mentioned the Port Said uh, massacre, um, which was essentially a political event. Um, 2016, there's a, a suicide bomber in Iraq at a, at a football match, kills 30 people. Um, slightly different one, uh, Omar Labidi, um was essentially pursued by the police, chased by the police and drowned uh, after he was leaving the stadium. There's been a long campaign in Tunisia to bring the police officers to justice. Um, they got, they were tried, they were convicted. They got two years in prison for killing this kid. Um, uh, in Algeria, again, Algeria, Football protests, I mean, again, we could, you can write a whole book about football protests in, in Algeria. In fact, there, there are a couple of books about football protests in Algeria. It's a very, it's a very interesting subject. Um, but the most re the, perhaps the most recent case the, is the Hirat protest, um, uh, which led to the removal of President Bouteflika. Um, and again, a large part of this was mediated through songs people made up and sang at football matches. So the, the, the protests spread through people recognizing the protest songs that were emerging from uh, football stadiums. Um, and uh, maybe a slightly more positive one ago, again, again, 2022, finally 500 women were allowed to attend a football match in Iran, first time since 1979, again, partly through protest against the exclusion of women from football stadiums. Um, so again, um, Football is a uh, an arena of political action as well as um, sporting action. So finally, the economist gets to the economics, um, which um, again, I sort of maybe, maybe I should apologize. I'm not a professional historian, sociologist, cultural specialist, or whatever, and maybe many of the things I've said. Are, are, a subject to interpretation, but I find that I can't talk about the economics unless I think of that context. That's why I feel I have to do it. Um, 
So one sort of basic economic fact is that the money, we're in economics now, so we're talking about money, okay, the money is in the club game. It's not in the national game. So, you know, for all the talk about the World Cup and stuff like that, international games are not really economically that significant. That's because they're just not that frequent. So FIFA makes about two to three billion a year. Just the big five European leagues on their own, that's England, Spain, Germany, Italy, France, those five leagues generated over $18 billion um, in 21-22. So that's what? That's about um, nearly 10 times the amount that FIFA generates. And if you put all the money in the international game together and you put all the money in the club game together, that's probably about the ratio you end up with, about 10 to 1. So the money is in the club game because the club game goes on week in, week out, year in, year out. Unlike the international game, which comes along every few months, you have some internationals. Every couple of years, you have a significant international tournament. But overall, it's not played that much. The second thing I want to say is mega events like the World Cup are really, in economic terms, insignificant. There's a huge economics literature on this. And there are many economists who will tell you actually it's very negative, that actually has a very negative economic impact on the country. I'm, I tend to be more agnostic about this. More, all I would say is if it has an impact, whether it's positive or negative, it's tiny. For most countries, it's a tiny fraction of GDP. And so by definition, if it's a tiny fraction of GDP, it can't have a very big economic impact on the country. Um, so in some sense, Qatar doesn't matter. I don't think it's we should actually pay too much attention to one. It's a great story to write about. It may be a great story to think about some of the cultural and political issues. But what's the long term in, impact of Qatar going to be? Well, I even doubt that that's going to be very significant. So, again, think about the World Cup in Argentina in 1978. It was it was organized after a military coup in Argentina, which led, caused the country to be led by a brutal military dictatorship. The, the famous, the, the disappeared, the era of the disappeared, people were rounded up, basically, and often used football stadiums were used as prison camps, and large numbers of people were executed. Um, bodies were never recovered. It's a terrible historical tragedy. And Argentina hosted the World Cup in 1978 and was allowed to do so despite all of these human rights abuses. And Argentina won the World Cup in 1978. So it was a huge national celebration. And many people argue it, it enabled the military junta to survive. And maybe it did. But six years later, they're gone. So in, in a historical time, that's not actually very significant. But we'll take another example. Well, Mexico. Mexico's hosted two World Cups, one in 1970, one in 1986. Long-term economic benefits for Mexico? I struggle to think of what that might be. Or um, South Africa, 2010, first African World Cup. M very highly symbolic moment, but has it had any long-term impact on the economics or politics of South Africa? I would say next to none. So and those, the, those mega events have negligible effect. It's the... It's the club competitions, it's the regular weekly club competitions that matter. The second thing to say about club, well, the thing to say about club football economics is it's very distinctive. It's very unusual, actually. It's unusual as a labor market. So normally when you work, you work in a context which is largely unobservable. If you're an academic, you hide yourself in your office, nobody can see whether you're, if you're having great ideas or not having great ideas, who knows? So, you know, assessing the productivity of an academic is really, really hard. Who knows whether we're doing it? And of course, you can look at things like publications, but, you know, I'm still working on my Nobel Prize winning book, which will come out in 10 years time. So what? how would you know if I was really being productive or not? 
but it's not just academics. It's actually quite true in, in most working environments. The ability to observe what you're doing, what workers are doing, is fairly limited, and that creates a problem for employee uh, workplace relationships. The employer really doesn't know what you're up to, and um, the employer, and that can be both. Uh, you can that you can use that as an opportunity to get away with not doing very much, but it also means that you may not be fairly rewarded for things you actually have done. The, so employers may discount actions which actually you did for them. Because football players work in the open. We, we're, that's the whole point. We're watching them work. So we actually have a very clear idea about how good they are. We know who's good and who's not good. And actually, we don't even disagree about it much. So, OK, we could have this debate, I mean, the last decade or so, the constant debate was Ronaldo or Messi? Ronaldo or Messi? All right. Nobody disputed that they were the two best players in the world. And, well, not nobody. Of course, somebody disputed that. But if they disputed that, I think I could name the half dozen players they could conceivably have mentioned alongside those names. And that's the thing. that If we think about ranking, if I asked you to rank all the football players in the world, if, I, if we all did this, we say took the top 100 players in the world, our rankings, if we follow football, our rankings would be very similar. They wouldn't be identical, but they'd be very similar. And there is a global market. There's a global market because it's governed by a single organization, FIFA. The rules of employment in football are governed by something called the FIFA Regulations on the Status and Transfer of Players, which is an online document you can download for yourself. And it tells you how employment is going to work. So unlike working in, you know, working in the United States or working in Britain or working in Egypt, there's going to be very different rules. That's not the case in football. Actually, the rules, the employment rules are going to be very similar. And added to that, you have very large numbers of buyers and sellers. So it's not like the case where most of us in our world, you know, if we could get one other employer to think about hiring us, that would be a real progress, right? We could really do get a lift if we got one. If we get three, wow, you know, sky's the limit. In football, there are hundreds. There are hundreds of teams competing for the services of the players, and there are at least 100,000 professional football players. Worldwide. So very large numbers of buyers sellers, and there's a global market. Go to any medium-sized club in the world, and they are currently looking at videos of players from all over the world to decide whether to hire them. It's become, technology in particular has, has really globalized this very quickly in recent times. So that means that this market approximates what economists call a perfectly competitive market. What does that mean? Well, basically means you get paid what you're worth. Doesn't that stand back? No, okay, I don't mean footballers are worth more than nurses and firefighters. What I mean is relative to other footballers, that if you rank the wages paid to the footballers, that's pretty much a ranking of ability. And let me show you that that's true. So this chart here, so we're in the economics, so we get to do charts now, right? So that's always, that's, I'm, I'm on home, home turf now. Um, this chart here, the, the blue dots, are, each dot is a country, uh, a national team, and the orange dots are the MENA uh, countries. And what it shows is the relationship between uh, the FIFA points of the national team. So FIFA awards points depending on how you do in each game. So there's a, it's a methodology for ranking. It's actually based on something called ELO ratings. You might have heard of ELO ratings are, are a very reliable way of comparing quality. So it originates in chess. The best chess player has the highest ELO rating. Lousy chess players have very low ELO rating. It's the almost impossible to fix it. It's actually it's actually a very reliable indicator of ability. It works pretty well for football teams as well. So these are national football teams, and what you can see here on the on the on the vertical axis is the the market value. So the market value is based on a from a website called Transfer Market. You can look at it yourself. And they 
they produce estimates of, of individual player values. And these estimates are so good that clubs now use them when trading players. They use them as a basis for deciding how much a player is worth. So it's a it's a very reliable measure. And the reason you can see it's reliable, the, the, the valuations are for players in relation to his performance for his club, not for his national team. Almost all of the games these players play are, are not for their national team, they play for their club. So the, so the valuation must be based on their club performance. So when they go to play for the national team, the valuation doesn't reflect the quality of the national team, the, the valuation reflects their quality as a club player. And yet there's this very high correlation between the value of the national team, the value of the players who participate in the national team and um, the, the number of FIFA points that the team wins. So that tells you that we get the, the market value is truly representing the ability of the players. That figure up there, the R squared, the R squared is a statistical concept. It measures, it says what percentage of the variation here in the variation in FIFA points can we account for by the market value of the players? And the answer is 0.85, 85%. That's a very high percentage indeed. It's not perfect. So it's not that we know, we can say exactly what the ability of every player is, but as an approximation, as an economist, if I could account for 85% of anything, I'd be very pleased, right? So it's, 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 not, it's unusual to have that strong correlation. So the market, this is a market which essentially, should we say, works in the sense that you get what you pay for. Right? It, it, the more you pay, the better your team is going to be. If I put together a very expensive team, it's very likely to be a winning team. Doesn't necessarily carry over to other sports, I should say. But now look at the market value of the league. So this is the market value of all the players in a given league in a given country, the top league. And the GDP per capita, so essentially how wealthy the country is. So what you can see there is you've got, uh, again, the, 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 the blue dots are countries. There are about 70 or so national leagues in this. And the blue and the uh, the orange the blue dots are com other countries and the and the orange dots are the meaner countries. And what you can see is it looks a little bit like a Christmas tree, right? Like a like a tree that's something like that. What that tells you is there is no relationship. This thing is completely uncorrelated. And so you've got England way at the top there, which is which is within this group of seventy nations is not is sort of just below the average, actually. So it's not the, by any means the most, the richest of, in this sample of nations. Um, and yet it has the most expensive league. Then you've got the other four, big four, Europe, Italy, Spain, France, and Germany. And what's interesting, I think, is to look here along this line here. So here you've got leagues with very similar values. Leagues where, in other words, where the quality of the leagues are very, very similar. And here you have enormous differences in GDP. You, at the bottom, you've got Brazil, which produces many of the best, world's best players, but they're not playing in Brazil. They're playing here or here. That's why Brazil's at the bottom here. It's own domestically does not have great players because all the great players are going to play in another country. Then you've got Turkey, which again, not a particularly rich nation, but has historically had a very successful league and produces uh, good teams. And so they're, um, they're on a level. Portugal, slightly richer than Turkey, but not much. And um, again, good, uh, uh, historically good teams. Again, a lot of their players are coming from Brazil, right? So that's, that's one of the ways in which Portugal make, makes Portugal such a good league. And you've got, of course, Saudi Arabia, which is the one everybody's been talking about recently, which has jumped up dramatically. They've jumped up in the last five years. They've jumped, they would have been down here. They've jumped up in the value of the league. And of course, they're using their wealth, pure and simple. And interesting, you've got the United States here, which actually on a per capita basis is richer than the United uh, than, than Saudi Arabia. 
um, according to the pen world tables anyway. Um, and yet their league is uh, currently about roughly the same in terms of quality as major league soccer. So essentially, and then you've got, you know, Qatar out here with, again, one of the richest with, again, not a particularly grand league. Now you might say, well, maybe I would say, well, what happens if you take into account population size? Which the answer is, doesn't help. Still doesn't explain it. What this is saying to me is that what makes for a great national league actually is largely independent of national economics. It's actually more of a cultural decision. If you choose to channel all of your wealth into turning out a good football league, anybody can do it, pretty much. Of course, you know, it would be pretty weird for the very poor nations at the bottom here to want to do that. But they could, in principle, because it's just about the money. It's just buying the talent, which is effectively what Saudi Arabia is doing at the moment. They're just buying the talent. So Saudi Arabia could easily progress right the way up to the top of this chart if they decide, if they want to, they can clearly afford it. And there's nothing to stop. And of course, this causes heartburn in Europe and other places around the world because they think, oh, no, that's that's not allowed. But why not? Why shouldn't they if they want to? Uh, interestingly, of course, about five years ago, China started down the same path and pulled back suddenly for reasons which are still not entirely clear to me. But that's also a possibility that, that you know, uh, it's like, it seems likely that European dominance is not which has been the norm in football, is not destined to last forever. There's no necessity about the dominance of European football. And even England at the top there, you might think England, oh, well, home of football and blah, blah, blah. If we, were, if we ran this chart in 1990, England would be well below Italy, below Germany, below Spain, probably a bit ahead of France. So these things can change. And they can change in, again, in historical time quite quickly. 30 years is not that long in historical time. And yet England has gone from being really alongside France at the bottom of the big five to being way out ahead. No guarantee that that lasts. However, here's an interesting observation. What Saudi Arabia's policy of building a expensive national league will do is likely lead to significant improvements in the national team. This like and again here we see the correlation between the the value of the national league uh, on the horizontal axis and the value of the national team. So better national leagues are associated with more valuable national teams, which suggests that and. It's quite a simple mechanism. If you bring in all the best players in the world to play in your national league, the local players that you keep will get better. They will definitely get better because they're playing. It's learning by doing, right? You will learn from the experience of playing alongside stars. So I would. So Turkey, uh, Saudi Arabia is actually somewhere below the line meaning that their national team has not value has not really risen up to the level of the uh, national league that i think will change over time you'll see saudi arabia progress gradually towards that line and so you'll see this improvement which will be a political win for the saudi government right? it would be when the national team does well that's that's good for the politics and that's just that's just the table which we'll you However, what I would also say is that building up a strong national team is not everything. And again, I would argue that that might be a temporary win for the Saudi government, but I think there are longer term issues which are more challenging. So, I mean, I, this is sort of my concluding slide. So I want to wrap up with, with some conclusions here about this. Um, so the first thing I say is the club rivalries are going to continue to dominate MENA football, as it does football everywhere in the world. And World Cups are just actually relatively unimportant sideshows. I wouldn't pay too much attention to that. 
So there's no doubt that the MENA leagues will get better. And there's an audience for this in the MENA countries. They love football. And so there will be better football will attract uh, strong support and a lot of strong interest. And it seems to me there's no question about why MENA countries might want to do this. This is a political uh, uh, motivated policy of putting money into football because people like football and it will buy you popularity. But I would argue history shows us that that was by no means enough, is that football clubs, as long as civil society organizations are repressed, football will remain the locus of protest. No matter how good the club teams get, it will still drive people to protest in the football stadiums, and that will continue to be a thorn in the side of authoritarian regimes. Um, which to me at least, I think is a reasonably optimistic conclusion in the sense that I believe football can be, under the right circumstances, an agent for positive social change. We've seen that on occasion in the MENA countries, and I hope we're going to see it again. Thank you. Any questions? So just to clarify, when you're talking about like local teams bringing in money, do you mean like in the sense of these are the clubs that have the most money, but then how does that relate back to the country? Like, for example, I'm thinking of like Lebanon, right? They have a lot of like economic crisis and things like that, but you're saying that these local teams bring in the most money. So how does that translate to like the countries? I didn't say that. Uh, so that's interesting. You heard me say that because what I said was, these local teams drive the interest in football, and that's where the supporters are. You translated that into money, and I don't think that's actually relevant. So I think, for example, you know, Al Ali and Zamalek are going to be huge in Egyptian on the Egyptian sports scene. That rivalry will be big. Whether the Egyptian economy is successful and they can charge ticket price is 10 times larger than they are today because people have more money to spend, or whether Egypt goes into a massive recession and people are impoverished and they have to cut the ticket prices. That's the thing. I think people will go to the football. The price will be set in accordance with um, the economic power of the, of the, of the supporters, the economic, the, the economic development of the country. But actually, the level of interest in the football teams will be the same. And so one thing, the difference is that Al Ali Zamalek might have, if the, if Egypt becomes immensely rich, they could have, you know, the equivalent of Messi and Ronaldo playing there and people will get to see that. But if they don't, they get some, you know, 500th best players in the world, you know, play. The support is the same because it's not necessarily about the quality of the football. It's about the rivalry and what that means for people in the country. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Um, you mentioned how um, you don't think that, or not you don't think, but that long-term political impact of um, like big, like the World Cup um, is questionable. Do you think that with the most recent one, Qatar, that that, that one is like, reflects the same as past ones that their political impact is questionable just because I feel like from what we've seen in the past couple of years since the most recent World Cup, so many things have changed. Do you think that's from the World Cup or do you think that's from outside influence in the Middle East and with football in general? Um, sorry, when you say things, so many things have changed, what sort of things do you have in mind? Like, I feel like the popular popularity of football in the Middle East has become so much, it has increased a lot. And like now we have European players and like South American players, like big famous players playing in the Middle East. Do you think that was due to the World Cup being, or partially due to the World Cup being in the Middle East? And like, or do you think that's from outside factors? Uh, 
Okay, so so I guess part of my thesis is that actually football has always been incredibly popular in the Middle East. So it's yeah. not it's not new. Yeah. It's, so it's, so in that sense, has there been an increase in interest? I would say if there if if there's been an increase, it's marginal. It's not very significant. It's always been a focus of attention in the Middle East for more than a century now. But now we just focus on it. Well, the rest of the world is noticing. That's, I think, the anachronism is that people who don't follow the Middle East say, oh, suddenly everyone in the Middle East is interested in football. No, it's not suddenly. They've always. So, I, so for example, draw the contrast with golf, right, where Saudi is using its money to build up its presence in golf. That, I think, is different. I don't think there's very much of a history of golf in the Middle East. It's not really ever been a big thing there. So suddenly making that the center of attention, that is wacky and different and completely strange. But um, bringing the best players in the world to play in Saudi Arabia or, you know, uh, in Qatar or wherever it might be, that is something that fans have no probably been crying out for for years and years and years. And actually, you know, it's only giving people in that sense what they want. So and that's driven. And I think it's driven by this by the Saudi investment in the Saudi Pro League not by the World Cup. I don't think that changed anything. So so I think that that that's that's my argument is that actually the the the, the impact of the World Cup is is negligible. Does that make sense? The timing of I mean this is not really something you would answer necessarily, but I'm wondering if the timing of the PIF investment into the Saudi Pro League could somewhat correlate to the attention that was brought to the media world because of Qatar. I might do so. Um, so one, f- for years and years, I, I was I was saying to people, why why don't why doesn't the Gulf create a, a Premier League that is better than anything in Europe? Because I would always say, I would always say, well, you know, put together Kuwait, Bahrain, UAE, Qatar. Saudi Arabia, put these countries together, put the GCC countries together, and you have the the financial muscle to do it. You have the rivalries to create. And what people always would tell me about is, well, these people just hate each other too much. This is just too much animosity to make this work, right? And I think, and so I always, so I accepted that, not, not knowing personally in detail whether that's true or not. But what seems to me to be have happened here is, yeah, so because Qatar got the World Cup, Saudi then perhaps felt that it wanted, that was a natural way to, to push on and show that they're better than Qatar. But so, yes, the rivalry it might be important as a, as a driving factor. The, the, if, if this becomes the way in which states compete against each other is by creating these, these football leagues, then that might, that might be a provision. But again, I would still say, it's always been a natural thing. It's it's a natural development of in these countries, in the wealthy uh, Arab nations, to build up a great football league. Why wouldn't you? I, think I, I would say they're late to the game rather than um, they're late to recognizing the potential of this rather than this being some kind of great, smart innovation. And I think it'll go further. I mean, my guess is, I don't, I, I, why should they stop now? Why should they stop until... Sound is right there, right up at the top. Uh, what impact, if any, will the evolution of sports media technology have on the economics at the local level? That's a that is a great question and something I didn't really address in the talk, but because of course uh, you're absolutely right. So my claim that that this is all local. I mean, when people in around the world are tuning into Premier League, I mean, I watch Premier League games on a on a Saturday morning as do. Lot, lots of Americans watch that, right? And and around the world, you know, you have large numbers of Manchester United fans in um, Thailand, right? So so there is, there has been a certain globalization of, of fandom and support. Real Madrid has a huge global presence, um, and that's clearly partly is is through social media, which is which is which has driven that. Um, and I think that I think the point is that you can only do that if you have the intense local rivalry to begin with. You can you in the sometimes you can leverage the rivalry to build up a global following. I don't think you can do it the other way around though. I don't think you can generate a huge local following by 
by building up a, a global a, a global rivalry. And so, I mean, again, if you look at what MLS does in the United States, it's actually trying to create these rivalry games within the US with sort of fairly modest success, I would say, so far. But that's the idea, is that if they can create these rivalries, then they'll create the excitement of the interest. And again, you think about you think about the Americans, the the, the the sports that do dominate Americans, you think about Red Sox and Yankees, you know, you think about, I don't know, um, well, I don't know which football rivalries we talk about right now as being the biggest one, but uh, they, they fluctuate, right? Um, people will have their own opinions on that. But um, Detroit Green Bay, right? That's historically, that's a great rivalry. Um, you know, but th- those things, those things are, are are already present in the dominant American sports, and um, where they're not um, in 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 soccer in the United States. I have an online question here for you from uh, Professor Mahfoud Amara. He says, uh, "Investment of Qatar and uh, and the Kingdom of Saudi in global football is explained mainly in relation to political agenda, stroke interests like sports washing, etc." and not based on business, economic rationale, and return on investment. How is this accurate or a more or a more a reflection and product of Orientalist vision about the region, i.e. decisions shaped by emotions and not by rationale, rational strategies? That's a that's a great question. And and I think that I mean I think that really, I mean, you, we could have a whole seminar on that, right? I think that's a really interesting. Yeah, I, I mean I would definitely say that um uh from the from the from the the Western view, if we, if we want to call it that, is going to be well. You don't have a big enough population to make this viable, so there must be some other reason you're doing this. And and I, the word sport washing is a new word, but nations have used sport to project political power, soft power, since forever. I mean, this has always been the agenda. And yeah, now when when regimes we may not so let, let me be clear I, I i i don't approve of the repressiveness of many of these regimes it's not that i agree with that but they're not alone in doing that what was russia doing with the 2018 world cup what was that what was beijing doing with the 2008 olympics what was argentina doing with the 1978 world cup and you know um democracies also use it to project soft power so there's no question that that's that's part of the agenda um I, I would say that if it was uh, to the extent that it was about sports washing, I think it's 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 backfired anyway. I don't think it's been particularly successful in um, advertising the regime to the world. Um, and I think um, I think there is a belief that leisure activities are going to be a driver of these economies in the longer term. Where what we might argue about is whether that is an economically practical uh, approach. Maybe it is. I I think there are some questions about the economic practicality of driving these economies through their leisure. Um, But again, it's pretty much a universal thing these days that that economy um, national governments are trying to use sports as a way to drive. Uh, economic uh, development and growth, and I don't think it's specific to Qatar or or Saudi or any of the, any of the other countries that do this. Well, I think unfortunately we've run out of time because I think we could have this conversation more, and maybe we will if you continue to come to these sessions. But um, can we thank Professor Iwanski one more time? Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. See you next time. Uh, our next one is, I think, uh, Professor Zakia Salime uh, in a couple of weeks, October 4th. Thank so much. That was fantastic. Oh, thank you, Joe. Yes. Do you want to do it? Okay. I'm trying to share both first, though. First, I'm going to hear I appreciate you doing the 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 I
to see you put the amino regions information in on your on in relation to everything else. I also you know that was my question. You know, you talked about the US. I like I I know what's going on in the but I don't explain the why because yeah, like um super like things that does have the reason I'm not so far ahead in GTP. Right, but really I put your hold on this. No, and, uh, yeah, and well, I, I, I think, yes, I think Qatar's problem is population size. And, yeah, yeah that's, that's the thing. I say, I, you know, um, if you if you put together Kuwait, Bahrain, Dubai, Qatar, UAE, Oman, yeah. you really do have the basis for a great league. Yeah. And, sure. and, and it's interesting that they are. Maybe this might change their minds about this because I can't see how Qatar could go. Right, it just right. doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah. The, the the entire GCC block there formed a one big GCC. golf super league. That would be amazing, actually. I'd be incredible, and it and it's totally viable, right? Sure. I mean, you know, they they obviously they'd have to play in the evenings, right? They'd right, probably play in the winter, right? But oh, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's good. Right? Um, and, and a lot of clubs are going out there for, for practice. I mean, I, right. I think part of it is, you know, I, I mean, one thing I didn't talk about was Manchester City and PSG. Sure, sure. So there's a, there are other routes that they're interested in. And then this question is, you know, um, to what extent are they interested in satisfying demands of the local population? And to what extent are they more interested in, uh, you know, integrating yeah. into global capitalist systems right yeah, that's a fascinating question yeah yeah yeah. No, yeah yeah i mean there's so many great questions oh yeah it's just it's just, uh, just really fascinating yeah thank you so much i really appreciate it well, i have to say thank you for thank you for inviting me yeah it really was a pleasure <laughs>